How does Nelson Mandela continue to influence our lives? And Daba Mandela, a grandson of the late South African president and the founder of the Africa Rising Foundation, has answers. He'll explain them next on Global Perspectives. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. What is the global legacy of former South African President Nelson Mandela? Ndaba Mandela, his grandson, has a perspective that only a family member could offer. Welcome to the show, Ndaba. Thank you, John. Tell us, just in a nutshell, what it was like to be with your grandfather. Well, in the early days, um, of course, as you can imagine, being a young man and moving in with this great statesman that the whole country adored, it was uh, quite a, a little bit daunting for me. And our relationship was really based around education and how I was doing at school. Um, and he was really a disciplinarian in my eyes. Um, of course, he traveled around, but when he was there, he made sure that my room was clean. Mm. And if it was not clean, he would scold me and make sure I cleaned it up immediately. And of course, to make sure that I was passing at school. Um, he made very sure to make me understand that as a grandson, that people would look at me in a certain way as a leader in my classroom and therefore I had to get the best marks. So from early on, uh, there was a lot of pressure uh, to do well at school um, and of course uh, to emulate him and to always make sure that I represent uh, him and African people in general in the best light possible. Uh, so yeah, and then as, as you know, things progressed, as I went to the mountain, you know, in my culture, uh, there's a rite of passage to manhood. You don't just become a man. You have to go to circumcision school uh, in order to become a man and go through all the processes. And of course, when I also finished my uh, degree, my undergraduate degree at the University of Pretoria, I majored in political science and international relations. Uh, he then started opening up and we, we, we had a, you know, a good friendship and we got to talk and share perspectives and what he did you know, before going to circumcision school and some of his views on, uh, on, on the world. So you were really fortunate. You, you didn't know him at all because he was in prison all those years. And so yes. you, you basically were meeting him for the first time when you were quite small. Yes. And, but then you had this rich opportunity to develop just a, an enviable relationship. <laughs> Uh, yes. what, what was he like in private? We always saw the public man who seemed to be very generous, very forgiving, very fair, uh, kind to everyone. And I, I'm guessing he was probably the same in private, but could you share some stories yeah, about that? I mean, he was the same. He was the same, but like I said, he was a disciplinarian. Uh, and, um, you know, one time, I remember, I had lost my school jersey for the second time. Mm -hmm. And I told him, and he was very angry. And he said to me, I will no longer sleep in the house, I will sleep outside. I thought that was very harsh. Mm -hmm. And uh, as the sun went down, he asked the lady who cooked to send me a blanket. So I thought, oh my gosh, I'm really gonna sleep outside. And just as it got dark, he called me inside and he said, don't ever lose another jersey again, otherwise you will really sleep outside. And uh, he brought me inside, I had dinner, I went back to bed, and you know, although it was harsh, it worked, because I never lost another jersey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, uh, and there, were, there, were, there were other times as well uh, where I thought he was really uh, an exemplary leader, you know. Um, I don't know if you recall the time when they were looking for weapons of mass destruction um, in Iraq, mm -hmm. and the the Secretary General at the time was the first African, uh, um, uh, what's his name again? Mr. Kofi Annan. Kofi Annan. And so the day they decided to go in to Iraq, my grandfather decided to send a very strong message uh, to the President of the USA. And um, he said, is it because that the Secretary General is now an African that America decides to defy the UN and go in to Iraq against the recommendations of the United Nations. 
and he left it at that. And uh, I thought that was very good leadership because he was supporting his brother. Kofi Annan was the first African at the United Nations, head of the United Nations. And that was simply it. He just put it in perspective and he left it at that. And just to make people think, but always making sure that people understood on which side of the fence he was. He was not with Iraq, he was not with America. Mm -hmm. But he felt that if the United Nations had made a recommendation that there were no weapons of mass destruction, but America still went ahead, then that something needed to be said. And that was the kind of you know, leader that he was. Um, many stories, many stories, um, you know. But what do you find is the most common aspect of his legacy that uh, people reflect on and use in their daily lives? You know, the one thing I must say about our grandfather is that he was very humble. He, he never uh, judged a person by their appearance or, or the class that they come from. Um, he always told me as well to be very humble. Uh, he even told me that I must not drive a Jaguar because people know I have money. Um, and a very warm person in general, you know. Um, whether he was dealing with the president, a famous actor, a famous athlete, a musician, or just the staff at our house, he would treat everybody the same way. And that was something quite remarkable that I never saw in many people. Um, and uh, very warm, and he had quite a sense of humor. I must say, um, always joking. Um, I remember once he, I actually brought over a lady friend uh, to come and have lunch with us. And he said, uh, he, so obviously introduction, etc. And he says, oh, did you propose to my grandson? <laughs> <laughs> but that was an awkward moment. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it was, you know, uh, uh, a moment in jest and it was, uh, it was quite, uh, light-hearted and everybody laughed. It was, it was fun. It must have been intimidating for her of to course. come to, to his dinner table. <laughs> I can only imagine. My gosh. So when you travel and people ask you about him, what, what, is, what is the most common question? Or, or do the questions vary? Um, they vary, but of course the, the first thing is that people, are you related to the old man? Wow, how amazing. It's an honor to meet you. So. People are very happy, uh, very delighted to meet a family member, of course, because of the love and admiration and the respect they had uh, for our grandfather. Um, and um, generally, they, you know, they want to know, what work are you doing? Mm -hmm. Are you continuing your grandfather's footsteps? Uh, because I feel that because he, he portrayed such high level of leadership, uh, people expect his family to carry that on, on some level or another. Um, and I'm trying to do that, obviously, through the work of our foundation, Africa Rising. Mm -hmm. We have the Africa Rising Foundation, which seems like an ideal way to continue in his footsteps. But tell, tell us about how it was established and what its goals are. So basically, um, you know, I was very lucky to have traveled uh, to a number of different countries, uh, some with the old man. And every time, I remember the first time actually I came to the United States, I was here in Florida, I went to Disney World. Mm -hmm. And as we were approaching the, the ride, uh, one of the gentlemen, you know, hi, how are you, where are you from, South Africa? And the first question he said, how big do the lions get? And I said, whoa, I, I have no idea. I don't work at the zoo, uh, I'm not a game ranger, so unfortunately I can't answer that question. And uh, I traveled to other countries and I got similar questions. It was about crime or it was about the animals. And eventually in 2009, when they had the 4664 concert in New York, you know, another question of, of that kind came about. And I realized that people outside of the continent have very limited knowledge in Africa. And so we went back home and we called a couple of our friends, about 10 friends, and 40 people came. So I realized very early that this image that was so terrible that was being portrayed in the media was not something very uh, special about me, that a lot of the youth in our country were thinking the same way, feeling the same way. And so we started this foundation, registered it in 2010, as an organization that would empower the youth in order to change the image of Africa. And we felt that there would be three sort of key pillars or areas that we work in. Education. In our education program, we have 
We are working on a resource center which is being established in the in the Kunu, in our village in the Eastern Cape, in partnership with the Nelson Mandela Museum, mm -hmm. and which will be a computer center as well as a library. And the first things that we want to do is be able to increase the computer literacy that's taking place on the ground, because we feel that without having a sound knowledge of technology, it will be very hard for Africans to be able to complete on a global level, when in Tokyo, children from the age of three years old mm -hmm. have already well acquainted with computers and technology. And so our other program is actually entrepreneurship program. It's one that we adopted from North California. It's called SAGE, Students for the Advancement of Global Entrepreneurship. And basically, they teach high school kids. Uh, there's two categories. There's social entrepreneurship, and there's full-on entrepreneurship. And uh, every year, they gather kids. Currently, they're in about 21 countries. And so the idea is that there will be two winners from each country going to compete on a global level. This year, the finals were held in South Korea. Uh, I am the African ambassador for the uh, organization, and I usually give the keynote address to the students uh, as a welcome gesture to motivate them. And uh, the winners in the uh, social entrepreneurship was Nigeria, mm -hmm. and the winners in the full entrepreneurship was the Philippines. And so we're looking forward to next year. It's going to be held actually in the Philippines. And of course, I'll be an integral part of that. And uh, we're really looking to see how we can really have this program exist in as many schools as possible, especially on the African continent, where we feel that entrepreneurship is really the key in order to unlocking the value and really creating that new level of leaders, not just political, but economic, and to make them understand that really the destiny and the potential of Africa really lies within the people's hands. And finally, we have culture, celebrating African culture. And so what we have done here is through the Nelson Mandela Day project, uh, you know, Nelson Mandela Day is all about giving away service to the community, whichever community you come from. Uh, we say 67 minutes, but in our country it's so huge because obviously that's his current of origin, people usually spend half a day or more. Uh, on doing community service. Uh, it's usually done on July 18th, but the motto that they've expanded since its incorporation in 2009 to say, let's make every day a Mandela Day. So you're not restricted just to his birthday to do community service, but any day, and you can dedicate it as something that you're doing for Mandela Day. And so the Africa Rising organization, uh, together with the Nelson Mandela Museum in the Eastern Cape, uh, we decided to then start this project this year, and this year was quite successful. We had a number of corporates on board. Unilever was on board. South African Breweries was on board. Uh, Woolworths was on board. And even the Department of Rural Development uh, of the Eastern Cape uh, was on board. And they did such amazing work. And once we had these five uh, community activation sites, women empowerment, children's activities, we had the children's hospital, we had um, women empowerment as well, and uh, sports. Uh, we then also had a celebration concert because it's also part of celebrating our icon's life. And we had the opportunity for Zendaya uh, from Disney. She came down to join us for this uh, special occasion as well as Nikon Vince who are artists based here. And uh, it was really amazing to see everybody uh, come together. So this is what we are now doing. Uh, these are the three main things that we're working on. And we're really building towards 2018. Uh, 2018, our grandfather would have turned 100 years, so mm -hmm. we want to build towards having a 100-year celebration uh, in 2018, and would love to invite you, as well as this broadcast community, can, communication to be part of that. Wow, that's terrific. Um, t tell us about your plans long-term on the education side of the foundation. Are you building partnerships with academic institutions in other countries, for example? Yes, we are. So this year we were, met, we were able to build a relationship with the University of Pretoria, where I graduated. Uh, this was our first engagement. So what they did, they actually brought students to our village as part of the Mandela Day celebration to do a career guidance exhibition on veterinary related skills and jobs. Uh, because we have a huge shortage in South Africa, because we're also one of the uh, biggest Im exporters of beef uh, and cattle, uh, as well as fruits, etc. 
so we're working with the University of Pretoria. We also have a local music, uh, local university uh, in the Eastern Cape known as the Walter Sisuli University. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working with them as well for them to assist us in building this resource center uh, in order for, to get volunteers, teachers, facilitators, uh, in order for people to then when they come to the center and want to engage in the computer literacy programs, the you know, basic coding that you know, we can be supported by the university. So that's also a new partnership we also initiated this year. And you know, in general, the long-term goal is to really have Africa Rising present in all 50 nations, uh, with local partners, of course, because we can't do it without local partners uh, championing the cause and really to be the voice of the new generation of African leaders who want to see the development of the African continent being led by Africans themselves. Mm -hmm. What about outside of Africa? You, you properly mentioned that there isn't that much understanding of Africa at all in countries outside of the region. Yes. Uh, what about ties with educational institutions in countries outside of Africa to, to help build awareness on that side? Of, of course. I mean, uh, I'm currently uh, doing a speaking tour. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to several colleges right now uh, across the United States to talk about Africa Rising, the work that we do, but to also talk about the view of how we see development. As much as we want to see the development being led by Africans, we understand that there's a lot of skills and expertise and experience that can be shared by the outside world, such as America, you know, because America really is at the forefront of many of the different industries. Uh, you know, when you look at Silicon Valley, for example, you know, America is really at the forefront. Um, and so Europe, China, et cetera. Um, and we really want people to understand that Africa is a place where you can come for holiday with your family and see some of the most amazing beaches. Uh, if you love animals, of course, you're more than welcome to come on a safari, whether it be in Kenya, whether it be in Botswana, or even South Africa. Um, and of course, business. You know, when you look at the top 10 growing economies of, of the world, seven of those are coming from the continent of Africa. Uh, so you really see that Africa has really tremendous potential. However, we have not been able to harness uh, the scale that comes in. And another important factor is that we have the largest youth population mm. in the world. You know, uh, I think it's 65% of the total population of Africans is youth, mm. meaning under the age of 35. So when you look at the potential growth of the middle class, uh, the services, the needs, you know, for this growing class, is, is tremendous. And so everybody uh, from the world, whether it be from Asia, from Europe, are all looking to see how can they partner with African companies, with African NGOs, civil society, even governments, to make sure that we have real tangible results and sustainable growth and impact on the ground. Hmm. And what about on the political side? Obviously, the political side needs to be providing some of the glue that holds all of this vision together. And I'm thinking, when I listen to you, I, I hear your grandfather, the orator, when I first became aware of him, it was through video. Yes. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have political aspirations, and, and if so, at, at what level? Well, um, fortunately or unfortunately, I do represent this uh, legacy of uh, Nelson Mandela. And, uh, you know, the way I was taught and, and brought up by my grandfather, he really uh, passed on some of his own values and principles to myself, which I've taken as my own, uh, which is to develop as many people as we can. Uh, you know, our village is, you know, really poor, high unemployment, and uh, we need positive leaders, leaders that are there for the right reasons, you know, and um, I feel it's, it's my obligation I feel it's my responsibility to, to, to take that mantle and to keep running with it uh, as, as far as I can, you know, to the highest level uh, I possibly can. And of course, I look for support, uh, not just in Africa, but you know, across the world. I look to America. America is already a great partner of the South African government. Uh, and I know they can do a great deal uh, in making sure that there are more and more leaders that we are churning, and hence we really, have great respect and admiration for the current president of the United States, Mr. Barack Obama. Uh, through his Young African Leadership Initiative, he is really doing a lot to empower 
the, the, the young Africans and give them that boost that they need, give them the tools that they need in order to, real, to realize their dreams. So, you know, politically, socioeconomically, we are really trying to do what we can. Uh, and so that is why it's important for me to be able to engage with you know, people from all over the world, really. Uh, those who want to see the positive development of Africa. Uh, because ultimately, the positive development of Africa means the positive development of everyone. Mm -hmm. you know, everyone will benefit at the end of the day. You know, so that's the, po that's the beautiful thing about it. It's not just about Africa. What, what are some of the places you're hoping to travel to in the future? I'm, I'm guessing the, the farthest you can extend your, <laughs> your reach around the world, the better. Of course, um, you know, definitely China is, is high on the agenda. Um, India as well, um, Russia as well. Um, here in the United States, we're getting a bit of traction, which is, which is going very well. And uh, the fact that our people and our governments already have a very good relationship is probably my uh, best um, sort of ally uh, right now, which is something I really appreciate uh, to a large extent. And I'd like to you know, continue uh, serving that uh, relationship uh, because I, I feel that there's a tremendous amount of work that can be done between our two nations. I, I love the stories you tell. Is there another short story you could share with us about your grandfather, something that maybe is not widely known? <laughs> oh, wait. Um, I'm not sure. Okay, so a lot of the time there would be musicians that would come to South Africa, and a lot of them, of course, want to meet the old man, Nelson Mandela. So this one particular artist came over to the house, and uh, they had asked me if I could facilitate him meeting the old man. And because he was an artist that I liked, I agreed. And uh, he then came over to the house. The old man agreed to see him as well. Uh, but on that particular occasion, I don't know, the old man was not overly uh, extending himself. Uh, he was very withdrawn. Uh, but nonetheless, the gentleman came over, greeted the old man, embraced him. Um, and, and asked to play a song for him on this piano because we have a piano there by the lounge. So he brought the piano closer and my grandfather immediately asked, what are you doing with my piano? I said, no, granddad, we just want to bring the, the piano closer so you can hear because he, he had a little bit of a hearing problem. Um, and then he said, fine. As soon as the gentleman started playing on the, compu on the piano, my grandfather opened up the newspapers and I said, oh, no, granddad, granddad, please, please put down the newspapers. Let the man finish. <laughs> and he grunted, and he just you know, sort of said, OK. Put down the newspaper, finished listening. And the gentleman then came over and uh, you know, thanked him again profusely, and you know, as, as you would expect. And he said nothing to this gentleman at all. Didn't say one word. He turned to me. And he showed me a picture of a South African rugby player. And he said, Ndaba, do you know who this is? And I said, yes, Granite, it's Brian Habana from the Springboks. And he said, good. And then he just opened his newspaper, and he continued reading. And I thought to myself, whew, what happened here? I mean, uh, was he not happy? Was he upset? I mean, he did, usually he would you know, engage with the people. But on this occasion, he didn't at all. So after a while, it kind of hit me, you know? And I realized that what he was saying in that instance is that, Daba, I see the American artists. Yes, they're great. But do you know your own African heroes? Mm. Hence, he had asked me, do you know who this is, in front of the other gentlemen, you know? So the message again came to say, Daba, I appreciate it. I'm happy with it. But make sure that your own African heroes, you celebrate them and you know them. Thank you, Andava Mandela, for joining us today. Thank you very much. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time.